Back to another immigration nation. This is Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, with another awesome guest that is going to be talking all about immigration processing and what the future holds. Join us in a second. All right, I'm here with my good friend, Richard Curlin. How are you, Richard? It's great to have you with me. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. I love this stuff. <laughs> Richard has been on a few of my podcasts in the past, and uh, as we've kind of transitioned into the video world, I couldn't help but pull him in. And it's pretty simple with Richard. I say, hey, what do you want to talk about? And so, Richard, what do you want to talk about today? Well, I think today we should have a closer look at the expanded IRCC e-file system, uh, as well as its... Uh, future direction, uh, and connected to that, the artificial intelligence decision-making system. Uh, so we're going to have to take a tour uh, <laughs> across all categories, temporary and permanent, with three topics in mind for you. How to prepare yourself, how to prepare your client, and how to conduct uh, your practice in this new environment. Awesome. And you know, uh, for those, Richard, we usually have a lot of people that come and join live. And so we will leave you guys an opportunity to ask a few questions throughout. But uh, for all intents and purposes, whether you are being represented by immigration lawyer, counsel, or whether you are taking a crack at this crazy world yourself, what Richard's going to be sharing today is going to be really, really helpful. So, uh, so yeah, where would you like to start, Richard? Well, um, e-file. What kind of creature is e-file? <laughs> so, you know, in, in the old and golden days, before fax machines, it was completing paper, mailing paper, handling paper, filing paper, <laughs> resolving paper. Well, uh, the new generation, the new technology, PDF, <laughs> yeah. open fresh doors. Uh, the problem, the problem was one of design. And if you're not trained in IT, you want to go electronic, use these newfangled PDF forms. Uh, how do you do it? And unless the higher-ups at the time have some understanding of design uh, and how all this stuff can mesh together seamlessly, wow. Uh, you end up with problems, and that's what happened. So um, Rearview spoke to uh, many of the companies that were tasked to create the IRCC system uh, for electronic filing. Uh, there was contracting out to literally over 150 software companies, mainly centered in the uh, Ottawa Gatineau area. But they weren't working together. They were working on little silos. So when I asked, what are you doing? He says, well, you know, there's maybe 70, 80 of these paper forms. We're converting them into PDF. Okay. But what does that mean? You're going to have all these different silos and nothing centralized. Yeah. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Fast forward to when um, uh, Minister McCallum uh, was uh, in play. I had a sit down with him and the then deputy minister to say, guys, you, you're going to reinvent the wheel. You're going to have more IT employees at IRCC than visa officers or decision makers. You're an IT department if, if you continue along your path. Just a little thought, but could you not? call on your sister department, CRA, and use their drag-down menu in a personalized file? In other words, you want to visit Canada. All right, enter your tombstone information on this centralized e-file system, and uh, we'll give you a menu choice, visit Canada. And that will populate your screen with a lot of questions that relate to visiting Canada. Now you're here. You want to work. Okay. So 
One way is to complete the work permit kit forms, what have you. Uh, or you have to e-file a work permit silo. What should happen is you go into your personalized folder, back to that menu, instead of dragging down visitor, go for work. The form will populate with your previous information and ask you new information questions. Well, Richard, I don't Richard, think so. If they don't, if they, if they do that, then they're eliminating all the ability they have to find misrepresentation when people forget to click a little box that was previously clicked on another application. <laughs> yeah. So, it doesn't go okay. That's a little bit facetious, it, but it, it, it does, yeah. it does um, uh, prevent uh, bad things from happening. And also it allows access to previous applications. Previous applications may be destroyed by IRCC or simply unavailable to applicants for whatever reason. So the consistency and uniformity in a one-stop shop per applicant uh, facilitates uh, the process, is more efficient, prevents bad things from happening, and allows IRCC to run the gamut of its internal checks and balances and decision making and you know quality assurance, what have you. Uh, so uh, the direction, the future direction may well be this concept of a centralized intake, uh, the concept of your own information locker for your own immigration case. It continues. After work, now you go back to your menu and you want to apply for permanent residence. You don't answer the same questions all over again with the same information all over again. That's a waste of time and money for everyone. Same thing to renew a PR card. Same thing to apply for citizenship. Goodness, what an idea. So this is going to be, I believe, where we are heading. Uh, and um, the changes are going to be slow to come. We're still at the stage of, for example, converting um, mail-in kits yeah. to electronic upload. Think of um, family reunification, the spousal category. Um, think of rehabilitation issues where you have to actually, you're being directed to send two things to two different places and hopefully one place waits for the results of the second place. It's just poorly designed, poorly thought out, but it's been corrected. So we're on the right track. Uh, and uh, that should be your strategic normative view of things to come. Uh, that's the direction we're heading in. And uh, that's the e-file system. Easier can I, to- Can I jump in yeah. for a second, Richard? So just for those who are trying to get up to speed kind of with what we're talking about, in the early days, they farmed this out, the creation of basically an individual's my CIC portal or the rep portal and all of the associated forms and the conversion of these paper-based to electronic forms that we all see now, especially in the context of a, well, even a spousal sponsorship, although it's still paper-based, these, these forms and these systems have all been kind of created hodgepodge. They've been, one's been created, then another's been created. And right now our world is not a unified world. Right now, some applications are filed through the online MyCIC uh, accounts. Others are filed through this new e, this e electronic filing for the PNP programs and things like that. You know, we've got Express Entry. We've got the TR to PR pathway that is its own entity once again, a standalone. So we have all of these systems that people are filing through, but the government is hoping to fix this. Is that is that what you're saying, Richard? And and the thought yeah. process is is to compile it all into into one, obviously, but to have it centric to the individual as opposed to the program. If they do it right, and I suspect yeah. they are, uh, yeah. that's the direction we're following. And they did take a couple stabs at it in the um, hmm, uh, mid two thousands, early two thousands. Um, um, uh, I remember having a discussion with an immigration minister, one that I really like. Uh, and I had asked her, uh, look, at, I'm, I'm watching the purse here and we're out $900 million. 
And she goes, well, Richard, what are you, what are you doing about it? He says, well, I'm not going to do anything about it because I assumed this is our security services burying a black op budget in your department because there's no way this should cost that much 900, money. 900, yeah. And, and uh, she said, yeah, and it's getting worse. So um, today, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they have this um, on track and in hand, uh, but they're adding another layer, uh, a, a critical layer uh, to uh, that kind of hardware uh, slash software. The idea is to engage uh, more and more the artificial intelligence decision-making process. Now, on paper, this makes a lot of sense. You can generate literally over 4,000 decisions in an hour uh, using AI. Uh, and you can cream off the easiest, least risky 70% of inventory of, of things like temporary resident visa applications. Um, and, and it does work. The key, though, uh, is the baby step process. You have to take baby steps. You have to make this AI system in teeny tiny adjustments. The consequence of getting it wrong are 4,000 wrong decisions an hour. <laughs> no one wants that. So uh, this has been... Now, can I ask one question, Richard? So in the context of AI, and I know we're going to get into it a little bit more, um, do you think there'll ever be a, a, a time when AI will be used to make a negative determination. So uh, obviously for positive, great. You know, they're, they're, you're approving because they've got all of the elements that you're looking for. There's no need for, you know, a substantive review by an officer. That's the whole purpose of it, right? But in the context of refusals, you know, some of the things that I've heard is that, you know, the, the refusal will go then into a triage to a real officer who theoretically looks at it. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first, in, in terms of priority, uh, refusals are the last priority for an AI system. What you want is to uh, raise the um, threshold of outcomes to be consistent with existing um, and well-tested over the decades uh, refusal rates. So uh, the focus should be on elevating, as a general rule, uh, AI to processing 8 out of 10, 80%. Of, of your inventory, uh, where you have an acceptance rate, uh, give or take, of 85%, uh, 87% thereabouts. Uh, yes, you have to control for certain regions and, and certain um, profiles, but your resources should be poured into getting the positives done. There are less resource implications uh, with the refusals in terms of AI development. There, there are more cost efficiencies and immediate upfront savings by getting the positives right, then move on to um, uh, negatives. Now, there, there are some, uh, what happens, as you correctly pointed out, uh, a, a negative um, still, by law, cannot be refused by a machine. Uh, that will change, I suspect, in the near future. Um, what you can do, just for fun, <clears throat> is to start to look at the approvals in GCMS and you'll start to notice that there, there may be certain code names, you know, that uh, assemblage of uh, numbers and letters identifying a decision maker. There is no way like um, NS00AQ did 4,000 decisions in an hour. <laughs> and so that's ripe for federal court challenge. And coming back to your point, Who's going to challenge a positive decision? It's only if that NS person, entity, yeah. machine uh, creates negative decisions that you may find the absence of a delegated instrument or the absence of the appropriate regulatory authority in play. So again, it ain't going to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so where the are they using this, Richard? Like in terms, yeah. in, the, in the context of temporary applications. Are there specific regions that they're targeting? Is there certain types of applications that people could expect that maybe their approval came via AI? Well, the good thing is that uh, I, I think the AI would um, identify um, 
renewals or second applications where there's been an initial positive. The whole point behind AI is to allow AI to look at the determinants uh, with its cold, hard machine heart, uh, and um, the math will guide uh, the result. So it doesn't matter where you come from, but if you've had three TRVs granted in the past and there's no yeah. adverse information, it doesn't matter what country you're from. It's uh, the challenge is primarily with the first timers. Uh, that's that's going to be uh, hard to separate wheat from chaff. Um, but you know that's what AI is all about. Um, just so you know, uh, you as a practitioner are part of the AI process. Like it or not, uh, your name is tracked over time, and uh, the outcomes attached to that variable will form, uh, in my view, um, a determinant. Uh, so if you're from an office with a 80% uh, refusal rate, uh, where that's not the norm and shouldn't be expected, um, your name on a file should, if AI is working, flag the file. Um, so uh, if you have, um, let's call them politely questionable applications from interesting people in air quotes, maybe they should be done by uh, the individual closest to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. Uh, so um, the AI system, while tested primarily in China and in India, um, have been kept under wraps and for good reasons. There's a lot of stumbling going around and it's embarrassing. Uh, of late, um, bad data um, in the Indian TRV process, AI system uh, was reported internally. Uh, there were uh, so much bad data compared to the China model uh, that the India model had to be either redone or replaced. It was pretty serious. Uh, so you have you're gonna have to and moving along protect yourself. How do you prepare yourself for this stuff? Well, the first thing, um, I know it sounds odd, but have regular backups of your electronic systems uh, at regular intervals, on site, off site. You are now entering an electronic world, and you've got to take electronic precautions. The AI system will also allow you to collect electronically uh, the key stuff from your client base. So let's move away from temporary status into PR. Uh, you're going to have to prepare yourself to deal with a lot of scanning, a lot of PDF storage. You have to make that executive decision to use cloud or don't use cloud. I don't use cloud. I don't use anything. I try not to use anything that um, may jeopardize the confidentiality of uh, the person concerns information. Uh, and so more resources to prepare yourself uh, are going to be required to expand your storage capability um, with AI systems. Uh, plan for the worst. If you don't have a bag of Bitcoin and some cyber thief grabs your systems, you're in hot water. So prepare for that contingency. Um, exercise caution at all times. Uh, other ways of preparing yourself. How the heck are you going to maintain your knowledge of all the ongoing changes in those AI systems or e-file systems across every category? Answer, you're not. And so you're going to have to buffer in extra time. Here's, here's what I mean. Even now, if there's a download file, I don't use anything in stock. Exactly because there's a risk that something new has popped and you don't know. Or it may well be that it's the same old, same old um, IMM that you're accustomed to using with the same date on it, but unbeknownst to you, there are more toys in the upgraded version. They just haven't told people it's upgraded and we didn't change the date. 
So uh, you, you may get to uh, consistently use new forms. Here's a way I protect myself, prepare myself. <clears throat> I provide um, the client base with three standard information collection forms before I touch them. I send them the uh, generic IMM 0008 and your background declaration and your family composition form. Let them fill it out uh, because by filling out those forms, chances are in the e-file system, you're going to be engaging. Those forms will have collected your information. Example, uh, a few weeks ago, people looking for um, temporary status in Canada with work authorization, open work permit, uh, standard, no surprises, didn't understand why I was sending them permanent resident application forms instead of a visitor kit or a worker kit. It's because those kits do not mesh with the online system. You will eventually be asked to provide more information. And you prepare the case with the intent of continuing service uh, through the transition between temporary and permanent status. Your guys think you're a hero when you upfront load all their personal information and all you're doing over the next year or two is updating. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Practically, people don't like to give you information after the first year. So if you've done those workers and students, and now you're trying to squeeze blood from a stone by getting PR information from them, no, it's not happening. So the, um, uh, at the same time, you will be able to identify potential pitfalls and, and profile issues from all of this information. You are upfront guessing what the AI system is going to look for. You can then address pop-up problems, um, refusals from other countries, um, old inadmissibilities from, say, um, existing family members or new family members, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, so uh, preparing yourself for the new e-file system, you're going to change the way your office is designed, you're going to install backup systems, you're going to install information protection um, procedures. You're going to train your clients to provide you with um, unusual and apparently immaterial uh, immigration forms completed. Uh, and um, uh, th th those are the, the main rules. Now, preparing your client. Something new. Bite the bullet. You're going to have to spend upfront time. You can do like you're doing here. Maybe just provide um, a recording <laughs> that your guys can watch as a training module on, on uh, how to deal with you and how to complete the information and why. The personal yeah. chat is best. Uh, so you explain to people that, look, we're on a continuum. Now, if the two of you, the, the practitioner and client and, and other clients, company family members are doing this right. You can create a system whereby you double apply. If you're applying for temp, then you all, you, you migrate all that information into say, uh, while it's still there, the express entry system, which will be changing by the way, very soon. And by populating your stuff into the system, you might get lucky with a meteor hit. Remember uh, in the last few months, we, we saw the point, uh, lowest point count to 75. Yeah. yeah. So you never know. Uh, and the clients think you're a genius. <laughs> you pulled this rabbit out. All because all you did was follow these procedures. So you also have to explain to the client what AI does and that look it it's a new thing it's normal to be refused the same way I explained to spousal applicants it's normal to have your kit returned like one out of four is returned for any reason or no yes. reason 
yeah. right reasons, yeah. wrong reasons. So get in your head the expectation you're pretty assured of having this baby returned to you. Yeah. Um, and that way their expectations are set. You're going to have to do the same in this new AI system. You may have to say, look, the, the rules change or systems got buggy. This profile thing didn't work. We're, it, we should expect to apply again. It'll cost you money in processing fees, but you got to do it. Build in your expectations. The more information the client has, the more control the client feels over the process. And the more control the client feels over the process, the less stressed and anxious yep. they are. Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> That's super important. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest, Richard, one of the things that we've done within our office is spend a significant amount of time teaching our clients the why. And yeah. when we go through that process and we use everything you've talked about, I have video tutorials explaining how we operate. There's onboarding systems and things that we put in place in our office to help people know how to fill out the forms. And then we meet face to face in a, a screen share just like this. We talk about everything. We answer questions. We look at it together because I simply don't trust that I'm not going to miss something in the process or that they're going to miss something. And the old model, Richard, when I used paralegals to assist me, half of the time they didn't care as much as I did about the application and they sure hex didn't care as much as the client did. And so I yeah. changed my model to a collaborative review model where yeah. we do it together with the client. Now here's an interesting question. This one came up from Muhammad. Some of them are thinking that this is just a recording. So I had to let them know that no, this is live and and the, the focus is on immigration processing today, you guys, for this session. We've got our, my guest immigration lawyer and policy analyst and every other uh, title he's had in the past years, Richard Kurland, who's, who's sharing some deep, deep insight on the direction immigration is going to go with their actual processing. So do listen and pay attention. But Muhammad asks an interesting question because we've already seen case law where officers have used LinkedIn profiles to refuse to find inconsistencies in applications. Do you foresee a day where, you know, where they're checking someone's WhatsApp history or, you know, or, or um, you know, other, other, uh, anything out there in the public domain or otherwise to, uh, and embedding it within, uh, in some form or fashion into the decision-making process? <laughs> they're doing it now <laughs> in a big way across the board. Uh, so I, I, I can assure you uh, that uh, open source is um open season <laughs> and so if you're putting stuff or others are putting stuff about you in social media <clears throat> or in uh, publicly accessible discussion groups it's all fair game uh, and uh, that's not necessarily an ai trick uh, that's just um, uh, an easy to find uh, yeah. item uh, and so um, some individuals, persons like myself, um, who don't use social media, mm -hmm. are not on Facebook, no Twitter, uh, no WhatsApp or anything else, <laughs> are uh, lock in their personal information. Uh, where it's going to become quite important uh, for reasons of money. Now, here, here's, here's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Hmm. The um, two things. So remember the visa application centers. Uh, they, 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 they are a disappearing breed. However, uh, turns out when you drill down on ownership uh, that uh, China um, had a financial interest, has a financial interest in the VAC system which uh, means that what cannot be guaranteed is the security safety of the personal information gathered. Who's related to whom? Who travels where? Uh, you start to run algorithms. It's a very powerful intelligence tool. So uh, once it goes public sector, let's say through just not saying it's VAC, right. but let's say, for example, the the, the, the current controversy here in Greater Vancouver is the city of Richmond creating a mass surveillance system last month where you can't enter the city of Richmond or leave the city of Richmond without being uh, surveilled. Um, and um, uh, cameras are everywhere. Uh, 
The problem there is that uh, the city is selling the data uh, 90 days fresh. Uh, there's no control, no monitoring, no oversight. And What's the property- purpose, Richard? Like, wh- why, why did they set this up? Oh, they say money, but they don't say how much money they uh, expect oh, to wow. from the um, selling of the private information. Uh, but a proxy can purchase and uh, sell it to an intelligence agency, foreign or otherwise. Otherwise, yeah. And if it goes into another government, directly or indirectly, you're never going to know why you bombed. Uh, because uh, access to that security information uh, will yeah. be the not. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is what I mean by um, um, accessing this personal information and use by AI. There's also, uh, you can do it voluntarily through your disclosure um, on, on social media sites. The question is, Amazon, Google, Apple, they're in your homes. They're watching your transactions. Uh, would they sell profile data, not your personal data, profile data, algorithms that will give everything except your IP address or your name? That would enhance security work at the government of Canada. It would sure would enhance profiling capability within an AI system. So um, what you got to watch for, and I've seen it happen, are those cell phones where you start talking about something and then 15 minutes later, you're getting Amazon ads. What? (laughs) I I emailed a client um, who's in Namibia. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes later, I got on um, an email with uh, travel to Namibia. Namibia. Advertising. So, um, yep. hello, yep. uh, it's a brave new world and you're going to have to prepare yourself and, and indicate to your clients that they better wash those social media sites, um, and, and, um, make sure things are accurate. There is the rule that if the officer has a concern and has, um, uh, gone to one of these external, uh, open source, uh, information sites, there's an obligation to give you a chance, uh, an opportunity to uh, know the case you have to meet. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if it turns into he said, she said, uh, it's poison. Uh, So the the clients should be told uh, of this possibility of a wide information access in hidden recesses of the internet uh, that you thought long forgotten or uh, particularly I tell people jokes there are no jokes no jokes yeah Yeah. and so if you were trying to be funny a long time ago you you may find yourself with a problem yeah and I can Uh, see and you've got you've got George here uh, um, Richard he says can we expect to see the Canadian immigration system be instant at some point like using AI to literally process and approve an application within minutes or days only at least is that the plan well it's the plan and it's uh, the future is now um, I, 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 I was, um, I got a demo from uh, the Chinese government when I was uh, popping over there and they said, okay, watch this. And they turned the screen <laughs> so I could see biometric capture by my fourth step, uh, to the machine. My whole file was on screen for the officer, everything, absolutely everything. Um, will that uh, be the new reality in, in, in response to the question, uh, not within minutes, within seconds. Um, what we are going to see um, in the near future will be the elimination of passports uh, from like-minded countries, reverting to the continuum of biometrics. So you will be captured, advanced, processed, from the time you park at the airport to the time you're in the parking lot of the destination airport, uh, a full continuum surveillance and decision-making system. Uh, that's that's our future. Is it a good thing? It's double-edged. It, yeah. it all depends on monitoring, oversight, um, uh, ability to correct errors, uh, ability to deal almost as quickly 
uh, with a problem as the creation of the problem. Right. <clears throat> so, and that means more work for us because yeah. uh, uh, we're going to be the safety net. We're going to be the fallout center uh, for a, a huge number of people in future. So good question there. Good question. Well, if you're okay with a few, I've got another one here from Muhammad. He says, uh, sir, the question is who has access to operate AI that is also yeah. a big space in the system? So there's yeah. a Will we ever see the wizard behind the curtain? Um, it, it's, it's tough. Uh, there, uh, who has access? Well, you're entering into a discussion of levels of access. At the highest levels, uh, the, the, the national security concerns of a country, the international security concerns of several countries, uh, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, the deal is, um, should the local police or constables have access to layers and layers of other information systems? So it, it's the appetite of the government of the day to be on a spectrum. On a, one end of the spectrum is today's China, where it's constant, invasive, envelops both private sector and public sector. Uh, the individual uh, is not going to be able to access this stuff. Uh, the Communist Party can access all of this stuff. Uh, so uh, the boast was made to me from the Chinese that um, they, it, it, they can arrest uh, a person with, uh, within 30 minutes or less in at least 70% of the country. And they were saying, we can have a guy in detention faster than you can deliver a pizza in Canada. So uh, it's a concern. Uh, and we'll just uh, wait and see. There are, there are levels of protection. Uh, the problem is um, young people. <laughs> really? The younger you are, the more likely it is that you will accept a big brother approach. You are more willing to give up privacy to gain benefits uh, the younger you are. Uh, and uh, the older cohort is a demographically diminishing cohort, which does not bode well for privacy rights uh, and uh, who can access all this stuff. Case in point, um, <clears throat> to... Um, hmm, it would be interesting, let's do this. It would be interesting if um, CRA, our taxation authorities, were allowed to run algorithms on the property ownership databases maintained by the provinces. Uh, so too uh, IRCC, because now you can cluster up your information and data match and build profiles. So for example, if you're IRS, you can say to British Columbia, you know, can you do me a favor? Why not run a data match on who owns what um, by American citizenship? And we're just gonna check to make sure they have been reporting consistently the income in rental properties mm -hmm. or disclosing ownership of properties, that sort of thing. So that's the future. Um, and when it comes to immigration, my goodness, it is, it's a treasure trove of personal information. Yeah. Uh, the question is, to what end? To what end? Uh, the greatest danger uh, is knowing who's related to whom. Because if the uh, local police stop you in Toronto and they get your family tree out, and then they run the family tree on an immigration database and find out that your brother has a CBSA problem, they squeeze you. That's the practical nature of uh, what we're creating here in Canada. So yeah, it's a great question and we can talk a whole hour on it. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, the, the, the deal is no, it may exist. Uh, and um, information uh, that is given to one government is accessible by another government. And I tell all clients, by the way, 
Have you been consistent in your information with um, the United States or Britain or other countries? Because everyone shares now. Uh, and if you think there's a problem, or if you think they're not going to find out, you're wrong. Yeah. Uh, you got to be more sensitive to the holistic, um, multilateral government collection of your information. And I'll go you one better. Okay. Here's the, the good stuff, the lollipop. One good thing is that if all this stuff is centralized and accessible by many governments, eventually you're going to see this. I think it's inevitable. You're going to see governments poaching other governments' populations. So if Canada um, um, needs 100 carpenters, well, why don't we go and dip into the New Zealand pool and have our guys send job offers to these New Zealanders and bring the Kiwis into Canada? Mm. We can do it with this system. Mm. So uh, it, it, it cuts both sides. Richard, what do you think they're going to do with this extra money? And there's been some indications that they may go back to occupation specific data or at least using those metrics for the points, you know, for, for express entry and in assigning extra points maybe for these types of applicants. And what's, what's your thoughts? A little bit of a tangent here, but what are your thoughts on that? The minister has been very, very hush on that. We've already seen this in immigration, the use of, of uh, occupational data already at the provincial level, but for the feds, do you think they're going to get to the stage where they're giving bonus points for uh, for carpenters and with the, with IRCC? Well, they're doing it now. I'm telling you. Yeah. Um, 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 oh, how's my video? There we go. It's uh, it's kind of chopping up a little bit, but we can still hear you. All right, sure good, good, good. Up. It'll catch up. It'll catch up. So, yeah. um, what goes on um, um, is, is that. Um, no one in the public has access to the express entry uh, selection process in terms of the um, actual instructions. All you're going to see is a number from a draw. However, the system does allow for input. And input includes a province. A province can say, you know what, um, this this politician uh, from this um, particular riding in the center of our province has a particular interest. This this company needs fifty workers. So uh, the local politician provincial goes to the provincial immigration person and says, we need fifty of these guys from the city. The provincial minister contacts the federal department saying, okay, um, can you run an algorithm or, or provide preferred points? Here are the variables. We want them living within 50 kilometers of city X. We want them to have the following knock -off. We want them to have the following work experience. And suddenly, there's just um, either an MR, a ministerial instruction or provincial interest that says 50 points, please. And suddenly they get passed on a draw. If they want to micromanage, which they can, uh, they can quite simply uh, have a particularized uh, ministerial instruction or a particularized provincial instruction. Here's an example of how it works with the Francophone pro program. And this, this is real. The provinces, uh, um, some of them, I should say, have francophone quotas. Well, how do they get these people? What the same deal? Uh, we want from this particular city or we just want um, um, this profile with uh, francophone points uh, given bonus points so we can meet our target. Or they can actually cherry pick with direct file numbers, we extend uh, a nomination or we extend uh, provincial authority to pulling them out of a pool. And you're never going to know. You're never going to know. Uh, so you, it, 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 the, I'm ill at ease because it's like running a lottery on an honor system with no oversight, no monitoring, no control. You never know how that winning ticket was really selected. 
Very interesting. And this is why I'm adding in <clears throat> profiling. You've got to know your profiles. You've got to build into your electronic profile, your case, things that will attract selection. And you got to think ahead. You got to think that there is a wizard behind that curtain, that there will be a need. I, I call them left-handed cabinet makers living in Northern Alberta. Uh, that stuff is actually possible uh, to do uh, under the system. Um, uh, so that's why your information has to be generous, uh, has to be specific, and uh, as detailed as possible. Uh, you're fishing with a wide net, not just one rod, one hook. That's, that's the philosophy. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. I was going to say, it's interesting as I, as I watch, you know, people, I'll show you this one here, Richard, and, and these are real questions, right? So, so mm. this Sandfish 01, almost guaranteed a <laughs> Chinese citizen here, will IRCC ask the Chinese application applicants really to provide the WeChat info in the future? You know, I like I, the, 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 they can ask for whatever they want, right? They can look for whatever they want. You know, how far they're going to delve into an individual's um, private information? You know, Richard, how far can they go? It depends on uh, how badly they want the result. Mm -hmm. So, again, the, <clears throat> how many minutes are going to be dedicated to doing a file? So you're limited in time if you're going to hit your daily quota, weekly quota, what have you. Uh, and um, if the case merits additional scrutiny, then yeah, they're going to drill. Uh, and um, if I were the department, that's what I'd be doing. Uh, I'd rather, uh, he here's a, an example from today in federal court, in a federal court case, <clears throat> there was a suspicion that the job offer was not genuine mm -hmm. from the Canadian employer uh, to a general farm worker in India. And so procedural fairness goes out for every business record of the yin yang for right. the company yep. delivered. They couldn't catch them on anything. And so the refusal, I'm not making this up, refused because of um, age, 45 and gender male. Wow. Those were the two reasons for refusal. Oh, With wow. No analysis, nothing else. Uh, we, we're not going to return to your home country, uh, no ties to your home, the insufficient ties to your home country. Why? I'm male and 45 yeah. from India. So um, this, is, this is something uh, that I'm glad to, <clears throat> to have the opportunity to chat about. What you should anticipate and what I am seeing right now, boots on the ground, is a tremendous increase in federal court litigation. And this is a good thing because it's become so less costly to take something to federal court uh, than at any point in Canadian immigration history. Uh, and you can, you can reduce the cost uh, again by doing it in two steps. Right when you have your refusals, particularly if it's an inland, uh, you, you file in federal court to lock in your recourse and wait for reasons to come. Um, and then you decide to reapply with new information and documents to address the previous concerns um, or litigate if there is a case there. Uh, and uh, you didn't have these choices before. You're going to need to make these choices because of the impact of AI. Um, the same general farm worker case uh, we're discussing reason for refusal um they compared uh, uh, family ties in canada with the ties in the home country that's what it says in the refusal letter a little problem there there, there are no family members no family. in canada yep yeah. and it's a template uh but the first reason for refusal is based on having family in canada federal court please yeah uh will doj pursue this no, they'll probably settle. settle. Uh, and by settle, it means that, all right, cancellation is refused. Go update your stuff. 
and we'll have another officer look at it. Uh, and you're going to see that more and more because, hello, the e-file system combined with AI is going to generate a lot of product. And um, accuracy is uh, going to be learned in baby steps. So if everyone's on the same page, including your client, beware of this stuff. Let them know in advance that this is a possible outcome. Everyone's happier. Uh, so uh, in federal court, oh, I can he just hear the questions. Mm -hmm. How much? <laughs> so yeah. it really depends on where where you are and how complex the matter. But I know from colleagues around here um, uh, that um, if it's uh, a few hundred dollars to get that case open all in, including judicial stamp disbursements, filing applicable taxes, great. And uh, the rest of the litigation seems to be hovering around four thousand dollars thirty eight hundred or depending on on what's in there not huge money given what is going yeah, to happen yeah. in future with the ai system you may find yourself in a revolving door with no exit once you refuse you have a profile mm -hmm. of refusal and that profile is going to be shared with governments foreign and domestic and unless you kick back uh, at the very least uh, to challenge it, if there's a palpable error, uh, you're going to be caught in future. And if they run the numbers right with profiling, they may discover that, you know, statistically, when um, uh, a parent has been refused a visa, uh, the children should be refused. And the data may support this in, in a number of cases. And, and this is what you're going to have to deal with in future. And so it just means greater volumes for federal court for the next two, three years until this stuff sorts out. My colleagues, I can tell you, my colleagues at the uh, Department of Justice this week, they are exhausted. Mm -hmm. they, it's, it's unfair to my colleagues. They're running on vapor. Uh, the volumes are unsustainable as far as I'm concerned on a human practice level. Um, uh, DOJ and even private sector. Uh, and so that trend is going to continue. What you can do is assemble um, a small gang of uh, go-to uh, immigration counsel like Mark, uh, who can stick handle these federal court things quickly, easily, efficiently, uh, with no scars. <laughs> and so uh, just, and I do those also, but get yeah. your list of, of people and the, the when there's a refusal, I just tell people by email, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> You're just just send me everything, a copy of everything you sent to the visa office and a copy of everything the visa office sent you. And then I'll give you the Goldilocks uh, choices yeah. of um, apply again, litigate or option three or something or other. Uh, that's going to be a way of life uh, from now on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And um, the interesting part is how far can they do this? Well, with permanent resident cards, why do we need to put these applications in? Mm -hmm. um, the government or the government is asking they for all, all the, the data yeah. the government already has in hand. Yeah. So what's the point? Just pay a processing fee and let their internal verification systems do the rest. Right. Days in, days out of Canada. Come on. Yeah. Um, Medicare card, driver's license, really? And updating your addresses? Well, it's already available through CRA, and you've given permission to access your income tax data. Mm -hmm. So what's the deal? Uh, and, and you're going to see uh, thinking like that exactly because the silos of information built up during the 1960s as a matter of political philosophy in Canada and elsewhere are being systematically dismantled around the world, um, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, that's going to have a significant impact uh, on you. Um, uh, just a, another food for thought, marketing for you. We're talking cabinet makers. So I yeah. reached out, and this is good for anyone to do. Same concept, but anywhere. There was a school, a trade school in Germany. Um, cabinet makers. Well, how would you like a summer vacation, working vacation in Canada? Mm -hmm. Cabinet makers. Hey, employers, 
how would you like to get these guys working at your shop? Yeah. And then once they're here, it's retention time and conversion to PR. Yeah. So with a little bit of creative work, you can identify the source institutions of people Canada would like to see here, marry them up with a working holiday, whatever it's called, these international yeah. uh, experience, experience Canada, yeah. experience things. And then control the process right to permanent residence. You're a hero to the uh, trade school. You're a hero to the employers and uh, to the families that come as a result. Um, and just uh, once you have them in for coffee, sell the donuts. The, the, the spouses get the open work permits. Yeah. And then folks uh, just consult you to make sure they're on track. Yeah. Uh, so what's going to be different yeah. with this e-file and all of these um, IT changes, uh, profiling and the like, you are going to be the nexus in a continuum analysis for the client family over time. That's what you want. You don't want to do the heavy lifting. You want the client to do all the information input. You review you are the conductor of the orchestra. Don't mm -hmm. play an instrument. And there's value added. You get to invoice. Each time you do a review for a new service, better for you, better for them. It's an insurance policy. Yeah. And without marketing, because you've got a growing inventory of existing clients that you will work with to maintain their status, renew, extend, uh, and convert uh, right to the end game of citizenship and then deal with the next generation. Yeah. So different now, when you have someone you're helping, it's almost for life. Uh, and um, we haven't had that capability before, but we will now. Fascinating. This is great, Richard. We're just concluding our, our last few minutes before we shut down here. I want to express sincere appreciation for coming to join and share insight. You know, a lot of the things that you've talked about, people are so inundated with just that, you know, they're just stuck in the weeds, right? They're, they're just figuring out, okay, what do I need to get this application approved? I know that if I screw the smallest little thing up, it's going to get returned. And the reality is for a lot of people, it could be their only shot at this. And so, so many people are so fixated with, with what's happening at the 10 foot level that they're not really thinking about the 10,000 foot level. And I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this insight because as practitioners and, you know, immigration lawyers and consultants and those representing people, this, this episode that we're doing right now is going to be, it's going to be, you know, critical for them to pay attention to it because this is the direction immigration is going. You know, they've got a lot of money to clean up the systems, to implement a lot of these things, but never before is a person's history ever going to be as accessible as it is, you know, as we see in the next couple of years. So um, yeah, the consequences of making mistakes, the consequences of fudging things, or maybe accidentally omitting, you need to be very careful who you are choosing to help you with your immigration application and make sure that, uh, you know, that you have oversight over it and control and that you're not just turning it over to someone without you knowing exactly what's going in and what's getting submitted to the government. Because like you indicated, Richard, this is going to have an impact on not just you, but your family and the way you've described it, future generations. And so you have to make sure that you get it right. Yeah, I agree. And uh, remember, it's all Excuse about me. helping people, all yeah. about helping people. And because of your training and experience, knowledge of the system, you are the archangel for uh, these families, you will protect them uh, and can provide information to reduce their stress and anxiety and bring them to their destination without the headache <laughs> and at a reasonable cost. Uh, so it's, um, it's more relaxing for everyone in future in this yeah. world. I agree, peace of mind. That's what we say, we sell, peace of mind. All right, Richard, thank you so much for joining me. This was great. I really appreciate it. And I wish you all the best in all of the, uh, all the crazy things that you've got going on all the time. Thanks, my friend. <laughs> thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Take care. See you. Okay.